Hello everyone. I'd like to tell you the fascinating story of the conversion of Reuben Thomas. But in order to do that, I'd like to go back a little bit in time and tell about how the gospel came to his family. In Uplook Magazine, August 2007, we had an article, uh, the story of Richard Varder, an evangelist who came from um, England and who spent much of his time working in North Dakota and Manitoba. And he worked along with fellow evangelist Alfred Goff, oftentimes. And uh, during the terrible winter of 1889-1890, William Monkman left his home at Balsam Bay in Manitoba on the shores of Lake Winnipeg. And uh, he began to take his journey to Selkirk, which was about 28 miles away. And his purpose in going was that his fifth anniversary, wedding anniversary, was approaching. And they were going to have a celebration. And although he wasn't a drinking man, he thought it was uh, proper etiquette in the North to have some whiskey on hand for his guests at the celebration. Now, halfway to Selkirk is a little uh, spot, a uh, poplar point, and that's where his parents lived. And so he stopped there, and as it happened, Richard Varder and Alfred Goff were having gospel meetings. They were having cottage meetings, going from house to house with little groups of neighbors sharing the gospel. And so he joined in, and uh, he heard the good news explained from John chapter 6, and uh, he, he trusted the Lord. Well, instead of continuing his journey to Selkirk to bring back two gallons of whiskey, instead he invited the two preachers and brought them back to his little home hamlet to Balsam Bay, and they began to preach the gospel. And very shortly, about eight more people trusted the Lord, including his own wife, uh, Mr. and Mrs. John Flett, Mr. and Mrs. Alex Anderson, Mr. and Mrs. Eugene Derby, and Mrs. John Rupert. And they were all baptized in Lake Winnipeg, and that's how the little Balsam Bay Assembly was established in July of 1890. Well, the uh, aforementioned Mr. and Mrs. Alex Anderson, Alex and Matilda Anderson, were brother-in-law and sister to William Monkman. And, uh, they were saved about the same time. <coughs> and hang with me here. Alex and Matilda's daughter, Mary Ann, married Henry George Thomas. And the Thomases had 12 remarkable children. Um, 11 of those were involved in the work of God. And I knew many of them, almost all of them except one, because I spent every summer with my family uh, during my teen years out at Faith Bible Camp, a camp on Elk Island a couple of miles uh, from the shore, from the, from the mainland. And they were totally committed there to the work of God. Norman, who was born in 1900, he was a boat builder, and he had constructed the landing craft called the Pelican. It had, had a drop-down front. Uh, you cranked it down and uh, it would ferry all the staff and the campers and all of their supplies over to the island uh, where they held the camp. And uh, then there was Emily, and following that was Reuben. And that's the subject of our story, but we'll leave him for a minute. Mildred, who was the head cook for many years at the camp, and uh, she, she was like a well-done marshmallow, a little bit crusty on the outside, but she was soft and sweet on the inside, and she was one of my favorites. And then there was Mabel and Phyllis. I enjoyed Phyllis's hospitality many times, she and her, her dear husband, uh, and, and she carried on a ministry in the hospital for many years. <coughs> and there was Dorothy and Florence, and then Gordon and Jerry. Jerry was the spark plug of the camp work. And, um, and then faithful-hearted Johnny and Gladys, whom I didn't know very well. She was born in 1926, last of the children, and she lived up north, and, and uh, I really didn't have much interaction with her. In any case, they were a remarkable family, uh, the backbone of many of the assemblies all through that region. They had hearts as big as the Manitoba sky. 
They were very direct in their speech. You never had to guess what they were thinking. But uh, they're all perfect now, delighting in life together over on the other side. But let's go back now to the story of Reuben. Reuben, the second son, the third child of the family. And uh, when I think he was 70 years old, I think it was about 1974, my father and Neil Dougal uh, traveled to Manitoba for gospel meetings. And the meetings were greatly blessed by the Lord. And Reuben, the only one in the family not saved, attended the meetings. And nobody really knew why was Reuben not saved. He understood the gospel, it seemed, and uh, he wasn't uh, necessarily uh, resistant to it, but he just never trusted the Lord. And so finally, my dad and, and Mr. Dougal went to visit Reuben in his home. And after quite a lengthy talk with him, finally they pressed him and said, Reuben, tell us, why are you not saved? Well, he said, when I was a young fellow, four of us were out in a sailboat on Lake Winnipeg. And we were having a, a lovely time, but then the wind died down and, and we were in a dead calm. And it carried on for quite a while. And finally, uh, one of the girls said, you know, we need to pray and ask the Lord to send us some wind. And he foolishly responded by reaching into his pocket, pulling out two pennies. He said, we don't have to do that. And he threw the two pennies into Lake Winnipeg, and he called on the devil to give them some wind. Well, the storm that swept up almost immediately was so severe that they barely made it to shore with their lives. And Reuben felt that he had made a deal with the devil and he couldn't be saved. They were so happy to turn to that passage of scripture where the Lord Jesus was accused of working with the devil. And he made that famous statement quoting Abraham Lincoln, um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Oh, oh, I guess I guess it was Abraham Lincoln who quoted the Lord Jesus, <laughs> but Abraham Lincoln always gets the credit for it. And then the Lord Jesus said, uh, "When a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace." He was referring to the devil, and the devil keeps his goods in peace. And they said, Reuben, you're the devil's goods. The fact that you can get into bed and go to sleep at night, one heartbeat from hell, with the wrath of God hanging over your head, only held back by the slender thread of God's grace, is proof that you have a false peace, a fool's paradise. A strong man armed, keeps his palace and his goods are in peace. You're Satan's goods. And you, you shouldn't be in peace. You should be deeply troubled about your situation. But listen, when a stronger than he, a stronger than the strong man comes, this is the Lord Jesus. He takes away all his armor in which he trusts and spoils his goods. In other words, Jesus can take as treasure those who were once the devil's goods. And they will be his in the day that he makes up his treasure. So, you can side with Jesus and he will deliver you from the power of Satan. You know, we have this strange idea that there's sort of uh, Christians and then there are a lot of really nice people and then there are a few demon worshipers over here. But when Paul describes everybody who is not saved in Ephesians, he says, we were the children of wrath, even as others. We were in cahoots with the devil. We were following his course. We were slaves to sin. And we were under the power of Satan. But Christ can set us free. 
And we can declare as we go into the battle, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so God saved Reuben, the last one of the family to be saved. And I was invited to the first, uh, what they call the senior citizens camp. Uh, and he came along for that first year. And uh, I remember him getting up on the testimony night and saying, you know, I'm just a yearling. Imagine, 70 years old, known the gospel all his life, saved at 70, saved by the grace of God. It's never too late for God to reach down and unite a whole family in the Savior. And Reuben now has joined his brothers and sisters in that heavenly land. And you can too. And your relatives can. The people you think are too hard. Maybe people who think they've made a deal with the devil. Thank God for the power of the gospel. The explosive power of the gospel to set people free. The power of prayer. And the power of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And to reveal to the heart the wonderful Savior who can save all who come to him in faith.